I think there's about 15 people here now, so we might as well get going with the introductions and, and all of that. As always, there's an icebreaker because one of the things that I know is that if I don't get you to speak at the start of the meeting, you ain't never going to speak all the way through when it comes time to talk up. So I, I I know that some people, these have been contentious and I've been I've had this question asked of me, but it's about ensuring that everybody's gets a chance to at least clear their throat and say hello. Um, because it gets you used to the idea that when you go to talk, you've already spoken, so there's not quite so much nerves. So, icebreaker, your name? Mine's Dr. J, your pronoun? I use they as a pronoun. Where I'm from, I'm working for the Department for Transport. I work for a consultancy called ThoughtWorks, and would I go electric? So, the stuff that we're going to go through today, um, I've prepared a little stuff to go through the bus stop, bus stop life cycle, because there's a number of questions that I kind of want to get to grips with and reading the NAPTAN guidance actually hasn't helped me at all. Um, so I wanted to get your views on what the bus stop life cycle is and probe and ask a couple of questions there. Then I want to ask you about what other DFT systems you use, what other members of your team use and what other departments use. So I can kind of get a bit of a layout of the complexities of some of this within within different local transport authorities because we all think you're the same. We know that you're not because we know that we've got 87 edge cases. Everyone's going to be slightly different. Um, then we're going to go through your top 10 business rules. So we sent out, we did a piece last time about which groupings of business rules were the best, were the ones that we were most interested in, were the ones that gave us the most value. Now I want to go into the rules that were inside those groupings. There's about 12 or 15 of them and I want to pull out the top 10 and agree that those are the bomb for business rules because that's going to help us look at delivering the most value as we slowly incrementally build up the new system. Um, then I want to ask you for some feedback around some of the BODS changes. Now this is not feedback about BODS, this is about the corrections that BOD sent to you and how that how that went through and what were the good things, what were the bad things around that, and just trying to understand what impact that had on you, but also um, how we manage some of that. Does that sound, and then I've got an action points, and I'm happy to also, if there's anything else you want to know, I'm totally happy to adjust and adapt and adjust the timings for this. Does this all sound good? And nobody's got the video on, so I can't see nods or anything. I'm reliant on voices or hand wavings. Uh, Tim. Yes, I'm just acknowledging. I'll wave him hand to acknowledge. Ah, uh, oh, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. So, um, if you click on number two, or I can share my screen, what would you? What would people prefer? Um, as there's only a few of you in the in the mural, I'll share my screen if you just give me a second. You should all now see that we're looking at a bus stop life cycle and you're seeing a person with we need a bus stop as a thought. Yeah. Excellent. So what I'd like to do is understand how we get what the life cycle is from we need a bus stop there's a whole pile of stuff that happens in between, and then we no longer need a bus stop. So there's obviously a life cycle here where a bus stop is thought about, is planned, is built, because even putting a pole in the ground, you have to build something, um, is made live. Do we tell people about it before? Is it a pending bus stop before before it's a live bus stop? What what happens if there's any roadworks around it and we need to move it temporarily or we need to move it 100 metres up the road because actually where it's sitting is not so safe? Um, how do we go about things like that? Um, can a bus stop exist only for the summer? Is it a summertime bus stop and not used in the winter? Um, and then I don't want to ask the school's bus stop question, but I might have to. It's just with all of this, if the is there a difference between a bus stop and a bus stop that's used for schools? Um, and how does all of this kind of stuff fit together? So what I'd like you to do, if you can, if you're on the mural, is take one of those stickies 
um, which is the second the the second uh, icon down, and it it reads as text when you mouse over, and there's a whole pile of stickies. Take some sticky notes and put them out there, and kind of plot out for me your thoughts on a bus stop life cycle, and I'll give you about five minutes to do so and then we can talk about it and see whether we're all thinking the same thing and thinking and how this actually looks. Do Is there a not in service setting for NAPTAN? I've been trying to figure this out and seriously I know somebody's going to turn around and go read the schema um, but I've tried to I've tried to understand this from the schema and I really don't get it. I think in, in NAPTAN is just to highlight where there's physically a bus stop flag on a plate, it's it's a public access node to transport. So regardless of whether it's going to be in service or not, uh, yeah. it shouldn't really matter. It, 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 Napdan for us is just a, a record of exactly where we've got bus stops all dotted around. I mean, in Greater Manchester, we've got, we've got nearly 15,000 Napdan points. Uh, they're not all in use. Some are only used in school services and stuff. Um, we, we have our own internal systems that will, you know, uh, highlight what is not in use for ourselves. Uh, so the team go out and put a not in use sticker on it on the bus stop itself. But as for the NAPTAN database, there's physically a bus stop there potentially to be used by an operator, as someone's just said. Then for when an operator wants to register a new service. Right. Right. So so it. This is really helping me. Um, so it, if you build a bus stop, the pain of building a bus stop is so big because of talking to people and all of that, um, that it's always physically there. And NAPTAN will always know that it's physically there, but it won't know if it's served by anybody. It won't know that it's an in-service or out-of-service bus stop. Correct. Correct. Right. I've got you. So uh, in in Naptan, there, there is the potential to uh, mark things if they're available or not, but that feature's never really been used. And okay. just because you might you might mark it, it unavailable, but then it's not really unavailable if it's potentially to be available. I think that was designed for um, you know if, if there's going to be roadworks blocking out a bus stop, you can mark it unavailable at that time or. If a bus station is going to be shut between 11 o'clock and 7 o'clock at night, you can mark your nap 10 points as unavailable between them times. But it's, it's not it's not a feature that's always been used too much. Cool. Uh, and I'll just put unused feature. Um, right. I'm going to go back to the start and read through people's stickies and see if there's any comments that come out from this. Feel free to wave your hand or there's a small enough group just start talking um, and if two of you start talking at once I'll just whichever one I see first will be the one that the, the one that I suggest continues talking so we've got we need a bus stop um, oh, just trying to make this a bit bigger we are notified of a new stop going in by infrastructure traffic teams and then add into NAPTAN notify operators of code notify our GIST team to add it to mapping layer, add new NAPTAN file to RTI system and post a system. So just making sure I get this right, the GIS team is your something infrastructures? No, it's our mapping team. Oh, it's your mapping team. Yeah, yeah, we have mapping layers um, for, um, it, for uh, on, on internal systems. Um, we have two, uh, one of all bus stops and one of stops that just have information at them. So any updates we make, we have to notify them as well. Because you need to print out the little posters that go on bus stops with what services are calling past and when. Is that correct? Um, that's for the post system, yes, but the, the, the GIS mapping layer might be used by um, other teams and departments within the council who might need to know where bus stops are. Ah, so this would be, so just making sure I've got it right. This would be like if I'm digging up a road, I need to know that I'm going to close a bus stop and need to organise moving the bus stop and things like that. Potentially, yeah. It's, it's just internal data sharing. Cool. G GIS means geographic information system. 
Ah, thank you. I'm sure I've asked it before, but it is um, acronyms are always fun. Um, and RTI, real time information. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I remembered a bus acronym. This is this is a whole new thing. I'm noting these down on my on my notebook this time. Hopefully I will remember. Um, so then we've got negotiations about getting a bus stop outside a house, which can drag on. Consultations with authorities, police, local residents for safety and approvals. Someone somewhere will need to board and access a bus requested by bus operator authority or something. Um, so can a bus operator ask you to put a stop in? Yes, it yeah. can. And frequently, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, I was going to say if uh, I put that sticker on, but yeah, if, if an operator wants to go into a, a new area that we've not had any stops for recently, uh, they'd ask us, well, we're planning on going down here and then we'd have to go out and do consult consultations to go and put new stops in. Cool. Cool. Well, that's... You, you always have the option, though, don't you, of having a custom stop where there's no flag or infrastructure there or a hail and ride section where you can just be, <coughs> deem it being hail and ride and you don't put any infrastructure in. We occasionally will put a poster on a uh, lamp column to say the bus comes past here, but there's no physical infrastructure or flag there to say it's a bus stop. You can just wave it down. So is that is that something that you use to not have to go through the whole consultation piece? I, I wouldn't admit to that on the recording here, but yes. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, let's, let's not admit to that and we'll just magically change your voice. In, in Greater Manchester, we have a lot of estates where we, uh, if, where it's not been deemed necessary to put a physical bus stop in, um, usually more sort of around less able people, customers who are getting out so a bus can just be in a hail and ride area and just stop as needed. Mm. Uh, it's only usually when sort of further problems go along or the buses get a little bit busier that we might actually go out and put some physical stops in. Right. And physical so, stops usually being for when we need to have high rise curbs, a bit more for access boarding. Here, okay. in, here in Nottinghamshire, we're not allowed to put anything on our street lighting columns. So we had a painful exercise of removing everything off columns and putting them on actual bus stop poles. Um, so we we do try and make sure at least every village in the county has some physical evidence of a bus stop, whether it be a both way stop where we create a custom and practice stop opposite, or you know just just something so people can actually find information about the bus services. Cool. So that's that's also really good to know. Um, right. Let me take on these purple ones. So there's a request for a bus stop will come from a customer or bus operator. Yep. Site visits take place to determine most suitable location. You don't want to stop on a, on a blind corner. Highway safety check undertaken. Notification letters to residents sent. Do people actually, uh, sorry, this is going to be a daft question for most people, but do people actually not like living near a bus stop? No, they don't. Although I say we we have notification letters and residents think it's consultation, given that we're the highway authority, we can even if they don't like it, we can still do it. But we just like <laughs> to let them know before something goes in and we get lots of complaints. Fair enough. Create net term stop and provide information to bus operator and install stop. So the so remember way, way, way back one of the first meetings I asked what is a bus stop and I talked about the difference between a physical and a logical bus stop. So you can have a logical bus stop before you have a physical bus stop. Um, so can you have a bus stop and say we're going to put this bus stop in in three months time so bus operators can start to plan around it before the physical bus stop is there or is it which way round does that go? Just trying to understand this. So in Nottinghamshire, um, if we haven't created a hail and ride stop or a flexible zone, depending on what type of service it is, um, we let them know because they'll need to update it in, in their systems 
so that they can update their real-time systems. So we'll mm. usually give them a date of when it's going in. Um, and we usually try and give them at least a month's notice. Um, obviously, not always possible when it's a new housing estate and they want to start running it from tomorrow. Um, mm. But yeah, um, it, it's obviously vital to give it to the operator before you install it because you don't, you don't want them to rock up the next day and something's there and all the drivers complain. Right. So so the drivers don't know that the bus stop's there, but there are people standing by what looks like a bus stop waving their hand and they've got mm -hmm. to do a bit of a crunchy stop, which yeah. is never fun. As an ex-bus driver, I've done that before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so we, you know, you have good, good operators and bad operators and some of our good operators will put driver notes out to say, you know, watch out for a new bus stop. You know, it'll be here. So um, I, I know other authorities will do things differently, but that's the way we do it. That's really good to know because this is really helping fill out for me the picture of what what happens before you have to even touch the whole NAPTAN stuff. Um, operator asks for a stop as part of new registration only 56 days in advance potentially. So I want to run some buses. So I come to you and say, I want to run a bus here. Can you put a bus stop into this place, this place and this place? And I only have to give you 56 days notice. It's it's seventy two now. Okay. Because it has to go to it has to go to a local authority first before it for them to accept it. But often um, the people that are accepting the registrations and get the seventy two days notice aren't the same team that install the infrastructure or that create the NAPTAN codes. You you may find that this information has to go across three different teams. That 72 days is a registration time scale, not a nap time scale. Right. So this is to register as a bus operator. No, register a service. Ah, a service as a bus operator. Yeah. Because I was thinking 72 days is quite a short time to get somebody approved as a bus operator and that they're fit to drive buses, but... I do come from another country. Right. Uh, let's do the purple ones and then we'll do the the yellow ones and see how we go. So in its lifetime, there's been a bus stop. I'm going to ask, we'll come back and we'll go through what, what happens should there be roadworks. Jared, your thoughts very quickly. Yeah, just to clarify, I mean, as, as, you're, as you're well aware, the... Uh, service model in London is different in that it's not deregulated so we don't we don't have a system of operators technically being able to run any service they like along any road they like there's a lot more sort of um, centralized planning of, of bus routes and bus stops so things like the sort of 72 day notification procedures that we've met we've heard about don't apply in London so what would tend to happen is that TfL would actually plan services um, there would be consultation because that's statutory under the sort of various acts that set up the London Assembly. Um, but we would we'd sort of define where stops should be um, as a result of new routes that are planned and also adjustments to current routes. There would, there would be consultations where there's buses going along roads, um, despite the fact that's a, ben that's a benefit of everybody, not just a few householders. Um, so we would consult, but it, it's not done to the sort of same extent. So if, if a bus stop was put on an existing route, we wouldn't necessarily do the same consultation. Um, so it's slightly different because, as I say, we, we don't have a deregulated bus environment. We have a centrally planned one. Mm. That's just to clarify that, um, just to sort of be clear. That's great. Thank you. Um... Jared, because I've been uh, living in an elephant and castle and travelling on some routes. I've been uh, part of that notification of, looks like you catch this bus all the time. You might want to know that we're we're terminating it here and doing this to shuffle it around. Um, so Di and then Tim. Yeah, just to say that if a new operator comes along and says, I want to run this new route, it's going to need six new bus stops. We certainly wouldn't be jumping to do put those physically in just in case that new little operator decides after three weeks, oh, this isn't working. I'm not going to do that anymore. Right. So there's a bit more 
a bit more involved that they demand and we produce. Right. Then they demand and we produce. Cool. What we what we might do in Manchester is, you know, we we can start there. Uh, we can put a Naptan point in as a custom point, just initially, and then there's a. So it's got an echo reference for the operators to use, and then at a later date, if it does become a physical bus stop, we can change it to a mark bus stop. Right, and then change. And Lancashire, we, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. We, we tend to stick up temp we stick up bus plates uh, with temporary on uh, to get us over the first uh, the initial start dates if it's on short notice, and then we'll. Uh, then backfill the nap times afterwards because we're not necessarily going to be in the right uh, place, particularly on new estates uh, mm -hmm. and new services. So yeah, we have the the temporary stop plate that goes up and try and that sort of gets us out of the immediate consultation as well. We can start the consultation while that's temporarily there. Cool. So so that also makes sense. So these are just those little short short poles with the word temp on them or something that you can just dot around. Now, those, you said those don't need nap templates. Do those, you still need to put those in nap tan though, don't you? So the bus operators will know about them. Yeah, we, we will do. It's just when we, if it's on a short notice or, um, for example, what you, you've been talking about earlier, roadworks, et cetera, mm. if there's a diversion and there's no stops on the diversion route, we mm -hmm. will put temporary plates up and depending on the length of roadworks is whether we do make anything uh, a nap to an entry or not. Okay. Um, this leads me to another question that I'm going to ask. You said depending on the length of time, on the length of roadworks, yes. what's the shortest that, that, that you would consider putting into NAPTAN? Like a week, a day, two we'll weeks, put, six months? We'll put it in for a day now. And, and in all honesty, Although we're the highway authority as well, we don't exactly get to know about the roadworks until uh, very, very late. Um, in some ways, it could be, uh, imagine um, road, uh, road resurfacing works, very uh, weather dependent, mm -hmm. and they will do, they will put a traffic regulation or order out for a period of eight months, but it might only take one day to do the actual right. work. Mm -hmm. So that's where we, we do hit a, a bit of a problem with that. Yeah, I can I can totally understand. Um, so, uh, trying to think of an example that happened, you you'll all be, I might as well tell you I live in I literally live on the bend of Elephant and Castle. I used to live on a roundabout, I now live on a bend. Um, so when I give these examples, people will pretty much know where I'm talking about. There was a water a burst water main that closed a major a main road besides me for. I think it was three months while they tried to dig up the road and fix the water main. Um, so there was a whole pile of bus rerouting. Now, obviously, three months is going to be long enough to have put the changes into NAPTAN and rerouted the buses per, uh, almost per, for those three months. What's the shortest time that, that you would think about doing that? And I know this will differ across different people, so there's no shade if if yours is literally I wouldn't do it unless it was a three going to be a three month. We're having to dig up half of half of London to fix this water main kind of problem. Um, well, let's go it again. Um, from my perspective, I put nap time stops in that effectively last for a day. Um, the reason being, if we've had major events like um, when we used to have the Ride London cycle event that went from London to Surrey, um, that meant there was one temporary bus stop in the whole of Kingston Town Centre. So it was worth putting that in for a day because the reason that I, I don't know what I don't recall um, that closure talked about, but obviously, as you rightly say, there would probably be a benefit of having alternative stops. But to say, if we've got a major event uh, with a lot of different communications activity that's actually, you know, referring you to journey plan assistance, then it's absolutely essential to have a temporary stop in. Now, if we put a temporary stop into our journey plan assistance, then we might as well load it onto that plan, particularly as third parties will be wondering, well, why are you give me a journey here and there's no equivalent stop in that plan? So if you've got, not we've got any large events at the moment, but when we've had large events, like sort of cycling, um, then it's sort of worth it 
worth putting a temporary stop in. Um, but that would be identified locally. So it wouldn't necessarily be part of our central planning. It would be my response as part of running a journey planning system. A more recent example, probably more typically, is, is we we'll get a situation that we'll get a notification of a bus diversion. And that notification will tell us this bus will serve a temporary stop on this road. So that wouldn't be a centrally specified stop, but because we've got the notification of it, we'll put it into NAPSAT. And it would, would again sort of, that wouldn't need an approval because it would be just what they call a dolly stop that probably all familiar with, which is effectively a, a portable stop with a logo on. Um, so they'll put that out for however long the road is closed and then take it away again, but it would still have a nap time and then we would sort of remove it when it's gone. But it's certainly beneficial from a journey planner perspective, both in-house ones and for third parties. So, you know, when I get notification of a temporary stop, I would generally put it in for that reason. And so, so that means that, Jared, you're you're doing a daily or more updates from your system into NAPTAN. I'm making well, that assumption. Be, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be quite as neat as that. So obviously, if I, if I, if I put a load of new stops on, then, then I'll be uploading to NAPTAN. But yes, potentially, um, you know, we could be, I mean, we're not putting that many temporary stops on because there aren't that many. But theoretically, yes, we'd be updating each day. But in practice, if we've added a new stop to NAPTAN, we'll do an upload straight away. But it might not be any new stops for a couple of weeks. And then we wouldn't do yeah. an update. But yes, the principle's right, if you say, yeah. Cool, I've I've got you. So, TFL, you've got the resources to do this. Um, I want to know about some of the smaller places, um, and just understand, um, like for like Dai and people who are in less populated areas, more rurally areas. How how long if there's been um, something that that that's meant a slip. I, do you have those in these countries where half a hillside blocks a road, um, stuff like that? If if a road's blocked by something like that, how how many days or how many weeks would it be before you thought actually I've really got to go and update NAPTAN about this? Just give me a guidance. I'll put up a little vote if that's going to feel a little bit easier for people. I think it depends on how severe um, the slip would be. We, we did have a slip. Loftus Bank got closed for something like five months because it needed underpinning um, and everything had to get diverted. Um, and once the extent of it became apparent, then yes, we did have to act fairly quickly. I mean, obviously the bus operators and the transport planners had to get in immediately and work out what they were doing with services. But uh, when it push came to shove, I needed to hold up my end for them as well. At short notice. Mm -hmm. Yep. You, you will find many bus operators, if they are going on diversion, they won't, won't pick up and drop off while they're on diversion until they get back on the normal route. Uh, okay. And uh, and for around, being around Manchester, well, I mean, said we've got 15,000 points so most of our diversions are already going down roads that do have bus stops on anyway. So um, just making sure so if if you're diverted and you uh, just so that I understand I'm on a bus and it's been diverted and I'm going past a bus stop but the bus won't stop at that stop until it gets back onto its route. There are many commercial operators that won't do that. Especially if they go, if the diversion is going onto a rival company's route. Right, that's that's really good to know, um, it because there's something different that happens in London, and this is just me unpicking what's London specific and what's not. Um, rival operator routes, okay, on divert. Uh, Trisha. Hi, yeah, I was going to say that for us it, um, in Nottinghamshire, it would have to be um, a significant diversion um, for a length of time. We did have in one of our um, small towns some sewer replacement works that closed major roads and diversions were happening for six months. And then we would create them in Naptan. But um, if, it, if it's 
if it's for a week a month we we definitely wouldn't it, and we have to it's just one of those things that you'd assess mm-hmm. based on on what the diversion was and whether people could access public transport or not um you know or whether I mean, a lot of the time we will get asked if if we can put something physically in there um, by the operators but we tend to work with the operators on what they want and what they think so mm-hmm uh, da, 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 da. Trish, uh, Trisha and then Andy and then Tim, I'm not sure if yours is a legacy hand or not. Uh, Andy then. Yeah, I, we do the data. I look after the data for all the Southwest. And I look at uh, some of our local authorities. Cornwall, for instance, recently had a, um, a big diversion where they were moving um, major centre part of the town or it was out of area anyway so we've got a, a rule that goes in that is if the data is known it's if it's going to be live for more than two weeks and or you've got more than two weeks notice it should be in the data mm-hmm. other than that we'll put it in our interruption system so it goes into the, our incident capture system capture interruption Okay, this is really helping. This is really great, everyone. Uh, Tim, do you have something to say or is that a legacy hand? No, that's a legacy hand, Robbie. Oh, fantastic. Um, Right, I am going to ask a very quick question. What about a festival bus stop or a summertime bus stop? So this is a bus stop that... um, and it could be Cornwall, it could be somewhere where you kind of, nobody runs this route in the winter time. there's no real public transport run across there. But in the summertime, people are, there's a bus stop and people are running across. Do you have those in Naptan? Do they actually exist? Mark? Yeah. And then Andy? We just put a custom bus stop in that's already in the Naptan scheme. Okay, so uh, uh, a seasonal would be a custom bus stop. Um, Andy. In the southwest, we have many. Sorry, in the southwest, we have many seasonal um, bus stops that's with um, campsites and that type of thing mm-hmm. that are in the data all the time. We've got we've got a couple on uh, Salisbury Plain for a bus that runs for the Inver bus that runs for a week once a year. Uh, we've got Glastonbury bus stops for the festival, things like that. So mm-hmm. they're all in the Naptan system. Yes. Uh, okay. Cool, all in that ten. Um, die. Yeah, uh, similarly, if it's I've got seasonal uh, network, the bus stops exist all year round permanently. But then I also last year one of my operators requested um, uh, me to put in a, a terminal point in a country park because there was a one-off. Um, park and ride situation going on and they needed to be able to get it into their systems and they needed a nap time for it to do that so mm-hmm. I just made a, a again a custom one purely for that service for that day that it was operating on that weekend cool so that was for a one-off festival and we're using custom um, I'm asking this question simply because uh, Mark, sorry, I'll I'll let you go and then I'll come back with this question. I'll come back with a, a reason why I'm asking this and if there's any further discussion and then we can move on to the next piece. Sorry, I was just going to clarify for what I was saying about a custom stop before. It would only be if you said something like it was a, a festival that and uh, the buses had to terminate somewhere that didn't actually physically have a bus stop. It put a custom mm-hmm. stop in. If it is, um, like some others have said, you know, a service that only runs in the middle of summer, but we do actually have physical plates there. They will just be in Napton all the time because there's a physical yeah. plate on the, on a lamppost, which can be available for any service to be used whenever mm. whenever an operator wants to do a route there. I gotcha. Um, so one of the questions that's come up or that's come to us is the notion that there could be bus stops that aren't held in Napton. Now, this is something that doesn't seem to fit right and I wanted 
to understand your thoughts. Is there any type of bus stop that you would not consider holding in NAPTAN? No. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'd agree, no. <laughs> <laughs> right, so a bus operator could never create a bus stop that you would never consider holding a NAPTAN. Well, they do occasionally stop in places where they think there should be bus stops, but you know that that eventually would end up in NAPTAN, or they'd be told not to stop there. I'm just trying yeah, to figure if, out the if right it's way. not in NAPTAN, you can't do a journey plan from it. I mean, it won't appear on Google Maps or anything like that, and it won't appear yeah. appear in any real time systems or whatever. In any systems, that's really, really great to know, and really great to to get our heads around because we're getting lots of different information, and we wanted to check with the people what are doing what are doing it to make it make make sense to us. Let me just double check. There's nothing here, and then we'll truck on to the next one. So, no longer serve. Don't take out unless there's a real reason, like the road no longer exists. If it's a NAPTAN, it's physically there. There's a bus stops flag, even if it's not there in service. Might not be in use, but they're totally there physically. NAPTAN can mark as unavailable if roadworks or time or time for bus station, which is a bit of an unused feature. Use NAPTAN to find out where could be where you could run a bus as a bus operator. Reliant on Google, if not in service, not shown on Google Maps, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, only time NAPTAN a uh, NAPTAN removed if a, a, a bus starting again only time a naptan removed if a bus stop is requested to be physically removed so this is i've had a bus stop nobody's gone to it for ages and quite frankly i don't want buses anywhere near this road so i'm taking it out physically that's the only time we would take it out um if a stop is physically there services removed from flag and notice put to inform stop and in use Due to cost for us, they remain in place to remain live in NAPTAN. We do remove, if there are complaints about it not being in use, but only do this if it's not been in use for more than 12 months. As often services change and go back on route. If we physically remove the stop, then we mark it as inactive in NAPTAN. Oh, that's really good. So do we all use inactive as the NAPTAN status? Yes, we are yeah, active and then active. Yes, we wouldn't. We don't remove any stops out of. You won't remove the the reference number out. You just make it inactive, and then after a period of time, you can archive it so it can be removed from your subsequent submissions. Okay, so inactive stops left in that ten, and then you can archive it after a long time. time. Yeah, yeah, if you think it's now coming back, I, w I would just put a caveat onto all this about the bus stops. The, the NAPTAN database will have the stops in that we know about. That's not to say that some random, I know it sounds odd, but developers go around putting bus stops and shelters in and that don't actually, you get notified about. And it's only later on when you've got an inspector out or something like that, that you actually become aware of these stops. So, so this is, I've built a new housing estate on the edge of a on the edge of a village, and I've put up a little bus shelter, on the expectation that at some point somebody will notice and run a bus to it. That's precisely. We've had that in well, particularly in um, in business development areas, because there must be some sort of planning uh, permission element that you've got to provide uh, public uh, service as well. And they've put shelters up really nice and everything like that, but we've never ever had a bus service around there. <laughs> right. So it makes it look like um, could be part of planning, could be part of planning. Cool. Let's move along to the next one, which is other DFT systems used. But th that's all been great. And if anyone has any extra thoughts on these, please email me and things like that. So I've put in a little stylized thing of NAPTAN, NUBTIG, BOD, Street Manager, FAIRS, FAIRS is the FAIRS reporting system. Incident reporting is there's been a traffic accident or road closed, we need to divert people. And real time bus information is that RTI bus information. I'm sure there's more. 
take five minutes, grab some stickies, dye if you need, we'll, we can discuss this over the top. And I'd like to know which ones you use personally. So just put a little me on it or a plus one. Which ones are used by other members of your team or your department? And which ones are used by people outside of your department? Does this make sense? I'm just trying to understand the, because everyone's telling me that local authorities or local transport authorities use all of these things, but I don't think we're talking to the same people, people. And I just wanted to just get a, a, a look at that. So hopefully this makes sense to everyone. And I'm just going to give you five minutes and I'll throw a couple of little circle notes there so you can grab them and stick me beside them if that's going to be useful. And if you need some more um, systems, please just stick square stickies or something like that for them. Looking at this, unsurprisingly, most of the people on this call use, use Naptan and Nubtig. That doesn't surprise me in the slightest. I've got a group of you who are using BODs. Now, can I ask people who put their little BODs blobs, are you using BODs as a bus operator because you're representing a bus operator or are you using BODs to read stuff? Di and then Trisha and then Kim. Uh, both, actually. I've got a couple of my operators I'm acting as an agent for, but then for the ones that I'm not acting as an agent for, I've actually downloaded the data that they've submitted to BODs and uh, had a look at it. Cool. And pointed out mistakes. <laughs> That's really good to know. Thank you, Di. Uh, Trisha. Um, it's it's both for me. I I download data to get it in because I deal with the timetables that go out at stops and things. Um, but also, um, as an authority, we are also a bus operator. So we so I'm providing operator data um, and will be an agent at some point in the future too. Cool. Thank you, Trisha. And Kim? Um, pretty similar to um, to Trisha and Di. Um, we're an agent for um, a number of operators, but we also have our own council services um, that we provide um, timetable um, data for. Um, we, we do the fares data as well for um, some operators. Right. So that's really good to know. Um, and, oh, Mark. Yeah, I've been looking at all the body data for Greater Manchester. Uh, even though we provide some of our smaller operators with the trans exchanges for the services, uh, and someone else acts as their agent, but for some, for some of our bigger operators, uh, I've been data quality checking the data that they're submitting because other journey planners are starting to use their data and it's quite bad for some of it um, in that they don't pick all the right stops that we say they do. Right. So so they're choosing, uh, they're sh showing slightly the wrong stop. Is that the? Yeah. Yeah. Especially at bus stations. Really. Stops. Um, cool. And then, so we've got the fares. Nobody's on this on this call is using street manager or incident reporting, but a lot of you are using real time bus information. Can you just help me understand? I and it's probably going to be blindingly obvious of the fact that you're acting as bus operators, so you probably need to know where the buses are. Is that what you're using it for? Is it that same group who's using it, or is there a slightly different grouping there? All of real-time bus information uh, is just uh, uh, Mark. Sorry, I was assuming your your hand was a legacy hand. Sorry, yeah, uh, I'll take it. Down. Um, yeah. For for Merseyside, the real-time information feeds into our journey planner uh, and the real-time information at the bus stations and so on. So um, that's that's the main use I would say of real-time at the moment for us. Right. So you know, know. the journey planner will actually tell you that this bus is running 15 minutes late or whatever and, and get another one, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. 
So um, are you taking that data in um, as a consumer standing there with an app or are you taking that data in to help you with your with your work inside what you're trying to do with managing your bus operators and your bus stops and buses that run around them? Um, as I say, the main use is, is a feed through to the journey planner, but we do take that data and, and it goes into a database which we administer, but what, what we're actually going to do with it properly, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the right person to ask that question of, really. <laughs> I might I might get some of our more techie people to come and ask you that question at some point, Dave. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> or not not ask you, ask you to set up the que the we'll we'll get our techie people to talk techie and talk data. <laughs> um cool. So that really helps and there's just that one group, there's just that one small or one person who's using the fares part, and that's because you're acting as a bus operator or an agent for one. Um, other members of your team, we've got, again, we using Naptan and Nuptic, which is not surprising. We've got a couple of people using BODs, a couple more people using FAIRS and real-time information, and incident reporting. Now, making sure that I've got this right, incident reporting is when, for example, there's been a crash and the high street's shut and the buses need to reroute, that's the system that reports that out and lets people know, hey, you've got to move your buses. Is Have I got that right or am I not quite thinking of the right level incidents there? Again, I'm not really the right person to answer this, but we have something called an incident capture system, which is used for sort of big events and so on, like when the city centre's closed off. Um, we had the, the, the three... Um, Three queens, it was called. The three Cunard liners all came in at once, and the buses were rerouted and stopped outside the city centre and things like that. Um, so that's our incident capture system. Whether that's the same system as the incident reporting system you're talking about, I don't know. Um, I don't know either, because this is some kind of... It's popped up in some of the conversations, and that's why I'm just trying to unpick what this incident reporting might be. Andy. Yeah, um, we've got, I'm not too sure what the DFT incident capture fares or real time system is, or the street manager. We've got our own incident capture system, which does as everyone else's does. It informs our, our apps and our journey planning on the website. We've got fares that works the same way in real time that interfaces all of our um, journey planning uh, outputs, uh, you know, signs on the street and things like that. Um, yeah, so I'm not too sure of the. I know it's going to be in BODs eventually, um, but that's a way, quite a way off, I think, at the moment. Yeah, that's. I know that it's one of the things that they're talking about, and that's partly why I'm just trying to make sure that. I understand the relationships between these different systems because everyone wants NAPTAN and NUBTIG data and it's trying to understand that that data flow a little bit better. Um, so none of the none of the members of your team are also using Street Manager. Brilliant. And then other departments slash contractors. So we know that some of the stuff is contracted out in different places. We've got a few that are using Naptan or Nuttig, a few who are using BODs, a lot more who are using Street Manager, and then a smattering around fares, incident reporting, and real-time bus information. So Street Manager is the one for, I'm a utility company, and I want to come and dig up the street. Is, is that right? Is that the same Street Manager we're all talking about? I'm just, I'm now going to go, you'll get to see me being very sneaky, show info. Trisha, you put a little dot on Street Manager. Can you help me understand what, what that you and me are talking about the same Street Manager? I put that there by accident. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, who was the other one? Show info, you can't have all, uh, Di, you also put a dot on Street Manager. Is it the same one that I'm thinking of? 
I've absolutely no idea. I'm assuming that the other departments will use something like that if it exists. It's not something that I'm aware of. I did put it there deliberately because I made that assumption, but uh, okay. I don't know the detail. Right, it's really really street, good to know that assumption. Street manager is uh, the portal that most utilities companies will use these days for registering TROs or requests for to open up um, for a utility, be it water, gas, electric, whatever. They'll submit their uh, application through Street Manager, which is picked up then by the Highway Authority or the team, relevant team in the, the council of the authority. I have a feed to that in that I get information from it purely for information only that will highlight <coughs> work on bus routes. It will forewarn me if there's going to be planned work on a bus route then I can react against that. Cool. Would it be so quick, quick question for you all? And I should start doing yes, no polls and things like this to make this easier. But hey, we'll try this uh, verbally for now. Would it be useful if you knew that somebody was digging up a road in the middle of a bus route? When they when 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 it was at the permit stage, rather than when it's at the oh by the way we're doing this tomorrow stage. Die. Well, well, we are supposed to be notified. Yes. Okay. Quite often we're not, <laughs> and we don't <laughs> find out. Until the operator rings in and said, "Drivers reported that they can't serve this stop because." But yes, we are supposed to. Um, it's by the there's new legislation. I think that we're supposed to be notified in advance of people digging up holes in the carriageway. So. Yeah, that's that was the uh, point of the introduction of street manager initially under the new guidelines for the Highways Act that they've got to obviously forewarn all authorities and relevant bodies of uh, an opening up process. Um, our authority signed up to street manager and. As I said, I'm on the recipient recipient uh, email that I get notified of any openings or closures or diversions to <coughs> request it for bus bus operators. Cool, that's good to know because we're starting to reach out to these different teams. Uh, that was Diane Tim. Is there anyone else who's got thoughts on this? If not, we'll, we're going to move on to the next bit. Um, because you'll be so excited that we're going to do business rules. So we're going to. Um, so you will have all seen that the lovely spreadsheet that's running round. And if you remember last time, um, I've struggled to get your feedback, so I'm doing it this way. If you remember last time we had, we went through and we have 131 business rules and we said we've grouped them into these different things and two of them were around acto codes and locations and those were the top two that everyone said these are the two things that we think are the best value business rules so what we have here is the business rules that were in acto code and location so what i'd like you to do um because everyone's on here now i'm going to give you mm, five votes each and what I'd like you to do is you can go and you can click on something to leave a vote on it. One of these yellow cards and you can um, shift click. I think it is or control click to make to make the vote go away. So I'm going to give everybody five votes. So this is around best rules. Now, this is the rule that you think is the best value. This rule actually makes a difference if this rule is broken if somebody doesn't use this rule it means that the data is a bit junk so you got five votes i'm going to give you a couple of minutes and i'd like you to go and put your votes on and, and tell me which of these rules you think are the best now this is not the final don't worry you're not setting something in stone you're just allowing us to see where we need to start with this okay and valid acto code stop points and water different admins, acto codes, streets, and then we've got a whole pile of ones. Okay, let's see how this plays out. Right, this is good. So let's start up the top. 
the one with the most one of the ones with the most votes is invalid actor code prefix. The first three digits of the actor code must make must match the area code for the local authority. So this is checking that you've put in the right actor code and you've not actually done a um, you've not had an oops oops moment or or anything like that. Have I understood that rule correctly? I'm guessing you have. Um, one thing to point out, though, certainly as far as I'm concerned, my software would not allow me to create a stop with an incorrect ACCO code like that because it's it's set up to always default the start of the stop new stop number mm. to be the correct uh, beginning prefix. Cool. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Our software wouldn't let you put anything other than a Merseyside or, or Halton uh, prefix on your bus stops. Um, also, when you come to upload it to the Naptan uploader, it would reject it, I'm sure, outright. Um, that's what we need to ask because we're building the new one. So we want to make sure that that's what we should be doing because is this a check that we absolutely need to run? would reject it outright. Uh, in that somebody could up, try uploading stops for a different area. Yes, I suppose it's a valid business rule to have, but I, you know, it's it's so intrinsic to the data that I can't imagine anybody doing it would. I can't imagine either, but it's 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 trying to it's trying to check. The next one that scored super high that got also got a three was stops and water. Now there's an interesting one here. Because um, um, we also have ferry stops, which are sometimes more than 50 metres from land because they're down big, long piers where ferries stop. Um, so this has been an yeah, interesting our, one. Yeah, our ferry terminals on some at. maps might end up in the middle of the river, even though they're... Um you know, they're on piers and so on. It depends what map you're checking it against. <laughs> it's It seems... Uh, yeah. Yeah, 50 metres maybe a bit. I don't know. <laughs> How far can people swim? <laughs> <laughs> Dependent on maps. I think this was to stop the let's put um, stops in the middle of the North Sea to make them temporary um, things. Andy, or was that you just talking there? I'm still picking up people's voices. No. Is this, is this warnings that we're going to get or is this coded that you can't upload the stop because you know depending what maps you're using the ito world uh warning system was uh showing a lot of stops in dorset that were in the water and it was just because their mapping was wrong okay dorset stops due to maps um that's actually what we're trying to figure out uh because as you know the ito world systems go going sometime this year and our systems coming on. So we want to make sure that if we're bringing on some of these business rules to say, oi, you might want to check this, we don't want to create you a lot of extra effort, but we also want to bring on only the business rules that are really bang for buck um, and are worth doing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tim. I think, sorry. sorry, Tim. Yeah, um, you, it, uh, at one point it was applied differently to different um, stops so it shouldn't have affected um, ferry terminal and ferry stops it should uh, likewise some of the ones about roads they shouldn't have ever been run against rail station data and things like that Stop. that's oh, certainly just... how they were done originally yeah um, let's make sure that we keep that. That's a really good point, and that we need to keep that thinking in our head. Of different stops have diff slightly different rules. Mark. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what I was going to say. Um, a lot of different stops have different rules. But well, things like the uh, stops in the water and stuff like that, it doesn't necessarily reject out an uptime. Um, mm -hmm. As most of our users here do use the ITO world warnings thing it will highlight um which it I mean it did to me the other day I, I created a new stop and i missed one digit out of one of my coordinates so when i've looked the next day um it's ended up down in the uh, 
English Channel, so <laughs> managed to correct it straight away. But it's handy to have these, you know, uh, the outer world is a, it's quite a good tool. But at least it just highlight it gives us some warnings, but we can also suppress it if we say, no, actually, this is right. Excellent. That's really good to know. Thanks, Mark. Um, so let's find the twos. So there was a two. Oh, I've got to zoom in slightly. Sorry. Uh, there is a two here. Stops in different admin areas with coordinates physically located. Oh, got to read this one. Stops in different admin areas. So this is a stop with coordinates physically located in a different authority to the authority who owns the stop. Now, is it Blackpool Airport where the stops on either side of the road are owned by different authorities um, on the on the on the trip out there and is it trying to capture those ones of oh, I've accidentally put in the wrong bus stop or something like that what's what do we get out of this um you're correct with the example of uh, the Blackpool one yeah one side of the road is in Blackpool and the other side of the road is in Lancashire yes e.g Blackpool airport and it also depends on uh which mapping boundary lines you're using because there are some areas where we do have it greater manchester as a bus stop but somehow it uh it's a world flag it up as being in a different area but it is actually give or take a few meters it's in our land <laughs> okay uh... this one might also come from some of the early days where if your neighboring authority wasn't um progressing with Naptown as quickly as you would like or you disagreed with where a location was um, an authority could um, create a stop that was out of their area and then use it in the journey planner and things like that so that so there was there were people putting stops in a neighboring authority for their own purposes um, in the dim and distant past yeah, cool. in, in Nottinghamshire, we've got the same where one side of the road is the city and one's the county. I think we've got two roads like that. So we kind of do a trade off of you own the stops on this road and we'll do the ones on this road. But one right. in particular I'm thinking of is we have an interchange point um, on, on one of our roads. Um, and one stop is in the county and one is in the city. But to interchange and put them into a group, they need to have the same ATCO start code otherwise it doesn't so that's why you know we, we may create one in a, another authority um with their agreement but it's for interchange purposes and things so it just makes more sense that the, the stops on one side of the road look the same as the other side yeah keeping things sane as possible mm. these are the these wonderful little edge cases that will we need to think about and make a difference when we do permissions and things like that so that we don't accidentally block you out of stuff that's really useful to you and things like that. Mark, do you have a comment and then we'll try some of the others? Sorry, I left my hand up again. Sorry. Oh, that's OK. Legacy hands are, are what we're all about. Um, stop does not have a valid ACTO code. The associated stop does not have a valid ACTO code. Um, I feel like this one and this one kind of fit together because if you've got the wrong prefix, you might end up with the wrong code. Have I understood that right? Or is there a bit more of a wobble here possible? Reading them, they do look the same to me. They're pos so one of the things is we've pulled these out of all of the different systems and some of the systems I, I, I we'll get down to the six that all seem very similar in a minute. Um, all the different systems seem to talk about them in slightly different ways. So just wanted to understand. Um, so these two same as same as below. Just stick that down there. Cool. Right, another two. There was another two floating around. Here we are. Stop road unknown. The street 
shown in the data does not correspond with the name attached to the road segment to which the stop is snapped to by the NavTech mapping data used by ETO. This is obviously an ETO world one. Um, can somebody help me understand this a little bit? I if voted on that one just because quite often if you're typing something in, you might type main street instead of main road. Um, and then obviously ITO would flag that up. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a sim it's a simple thing to mistake to make. Um, there are instances where, you know, it's it's got it wrong, but most mm -hmm. of the time um, it's just something like, you know, putting street instead of road. Or you've plotted the point and it's on a corner and it can't decide which part of the road it's on. <laughs> point on corner. Um, Dave. Yeah, I, just to, to go on to that, there are many different road networks, some of which have different spellings and different names for the same road. So if you're relying solely on, say, Navtech, which ITO World is using, and you happen to be snapping to an ordnance survey product or something like that, you're going to have things, you know, people arguing round and round in circles on that one. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm not entirely sure how useful it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, Tim. Um, yeah, similar to, to that one, um, there were some examples um, where different mapping systems had different points on the road network where the name changed on a long road um, and uh, authorities tended back then at least to use um, Ordnance Survey um, and uh, OpenStreetMap was being compared to uh, a Navtech and they all had different um, points at which the name changed. Mm -hmm. So it's a yeah. it's useful for flagging that up um, to try and get some consensus and manage the mapping suppliers. Yeah, I think that's some questions that we might need to, I can't spell consensus, I'll go back and sort it out in a minute. Um, I think there's obviously some questions about mapping suppliers and which map should be the map that we need to uh, come and chat to use all about. Mark. Yeah, I'm just going to agree with sort of everyone there that it all depends on what mapping thing you uh, basically you're basing it on and some have it slightly wrong. Uh, it's a good warning to have that we can go and check, but as with ITO World, it's good to be able to suppress it to say, well, we've looked at it and we've agreed that we are right. Um, as as for doing your final comment then about talking to us about mapping things, uh, different organisations have different licensing for what programmes they can and can't use within the business. So you'd be pushed, hard pushed trying to find one unified um, programme to everyone to work off. Yeah, I, I was... Um... Unified is less good. Uh, I tend to go for consensus of like, we agree that this is going to be the one and we understand that that means that our stuff is going to be slightly out and here's, we we understand the differences that we're going to meet. Um, to me is quite important. Um, we've got a little bit yeah. of time left. I'm just double checking on time because I'm rubbish at these things. Cool. I, th I think with a, sorry, with, with a ITO world there, because it's using open street map, uh, OpenStreetMap is a free editing public domain that anyone can go and edit. Um, I know I've gone in and edited a few road names to correct them to how I know physically they are. Um, it's, it's open for people to change, but it's also open for general public to go and get wrong as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think because because one of the words that's come up recently is the USRN number, the unique street reference number, might become something that we start to look into. But um, that comes, that's used a lot in Street Manager. But it's how would we link up with that? And is what Street Manager uses going to be really ideal for us? And how, how are we going to mix and match and not make a mess? Uh, last little bit on. Those are all the twos, I believe. This stop water geocode is those two are the same. Believe it or not, we have two rules that are identical, but they're they come from two different systems and two different checks. Um, so 
<laughs> Excellent. All of these ones are apart from stop stop proximity, which uh, looks exactly the same. There are this one. Oh, yep. No, those are all the same. So we have a stop road being 250 metres away from a, of, of its coordinates, can't find a road. Then we've got it 200 metres from a road, and then we've got 100 metres from a road. Now, are, these are all, to me, measuring the same thing. How far is the stop from a road? Have I understood this correctly, or is there a specific detail between these four that I've not picked up? Uh, it might be that you've got different rules for different types of nap time points. Nope. These are all the, this is exactly as they're written. And this right. is exactly as they, sorry, I didn't mean to go no. Uh, that's, you're wrong, I meant. No, I've gone through them and tried to understand what they're, what they're looking at. And if they are looking at different nap time points, no, they're all about the stop and the location to a road. Um, only bus stops, though as far as I can tell, although these could also measure ferries for all we know. Tim, hopefully you've got some sanity to provide here. You're on mute if you're trying to provide sanity. Yeah, um, le less sanity, certainly, <laughs> being on mute. Um, there is a subtle difference in some um, mapping systems i'm trying to remember which one it is that regards a road and a street differently and so when you're using um a programmable search if you search for a road you won't always pick up the nearest bit of highway um so you need to search for road and street but i'm trying to remember which it is um it's one of the gis systems um, so that's maybe why you've got some talking about road and some street. Okay, that that kind of helps me understand some of the language. Andy, you've got some sanity on this? I haven't got much sanity on that, but I know that ISO World don't update their mapping as often as we do. We update our GIS and mapping every week. So we have a lot of new roads that come up with warnings on ITO saying this is you know, however distance away from a road because their road map hasn't been updated and ours has and we've, we've got a new town being built or new roads gone in or something. Um, so this is obviously going to be something that we need to consider when we're looking at what mapping software may, we might use for doing this um, to make sure that it's one that is up, taking feeds and is updated as much, as often as possible. As, yeah, we, when we had previous software and we had OS mapping, which was very expensive, we used to have updates once a year or once every four years. Actually, there's one time. Now wow. we get updates every week from from OSM. So from, you, know, you need regular updates is the is the main thing. Yeah. Um, what was the one that that you're using that gives you it almost faster? I didn't quite catch the name of uh, it. OSM. OSM. Open street map. Ah, right. Street map. Can I just add, um, as, as a bit of an aside to that, some of the road networks uh, have a distinction of private roads and so on. Uh, and I'm aware of a couple of stops on Merseyside. There's one in Aintree Racecourse, which might not be classed as a road, even though it is a road, if you sort of mean, because it's not owned by the highway authority or whatever. And there's also ones in Ashworth Hospital as well, similarly. Cool uh, noise here. I'm just calling it noise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm uh, finding it interesting that there's one set that you haven't highlighted as being important because it's the one that I know we've focused on a lot with BODs is the wrong bearing questions. Um, and we've got two rules and we've only had one vote on them. Is there any thoughts on the bearing issues that you want to talk about, or shall we go straight on to talking about it from BODS? Tricia. 
Yeah, I have. I've come about something very recently with bearings that a lot of real time systems use. Well, one of our real time systems uses the bearing. So if we have the bearing wrong, then um, the predictions don't go to the stop and the, on the sign on street correctly. I don't know if anybody else has had that issue, but it's come about recently with one of our operators. Yeah, it's on our, uh, our ticket system takes account of the bearing as well. So the bearing does need to be right for that. Cool. Um, and when you put in the, so quick question for you, when you put in the bearings, do you prefer to do northwest, southeast, or do you prefer to do the numbers? Which is more inside your head? Geographic for me, northwest, southeast, in the, yeah. on the basis that you never know where you're measuring from for a, a bit, a, an angle. <laughs> yeah, um, northwest, southeast for me too. Cool. That's 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 really great to know. So let's move on to the last one. Now, I thought this is a bit contentious, and I just kind of want to open it out. Um, and w we can also ditch the side of the recording if anything far too contentious comes up. But what I wanted you to think about, and I've used the inside out Im images here. Um, what from the BODS corrections, because I know BODS came out and gave all of you spreadsheets and spreadsheets of stuff that needed to be corrected to different ways. What from those corrections made you happy, gave you joy? You looked at them and you did the Marie Kondo. Yes, this gives me joy and I'm very happy for it. What from those frustrated you? I, I should have put that one so that it's a bit more open. There's a lot more space, but we'll see. We'll see how we go. And what made you sad? What made you look at it and just go, oh, no and made you sad so let's take five minutes throw some stickies up there um we can make it so that we don't see who put which sticky up um when we when we release the recording so feel free to be as open and honest and just let us know how you felt about these things because to me that's really important to get that feedback and really understand because if we need to bring corrections to you we we want to make you feel happy with the we don't want you to feel frustrated or sad about them. So I'm going to give you five minutes and then um, we'll come back and talk through them. So hopefully everyone's had a chance to put up their thoughts. Let's start off with the joy and then we'll we'll start off with the one thing that made us happy and then we'll work our way backwards. So somebody was very happy that their list wasn't very long, which I think is a great joy. Um, and that it's really good that we had that had that moment. Um, if you want to say anything, if I if I read something out and you want to discuss it, just raise a hand and we'll definitely talk it through. So what frustrated us? That the list was so long, yet less than five amendments needed to be made in the raw data. No acknowledgement of the quality of the original data. I could t I can totally empathise with that. False positives, i.e. was told the bearing was wrong, but it was actually correct. Um, yeah, I can also understand that. And I'm guessing that came because of the mapping software that was used for the roads to calculate the bearings. Or was that just, you don't know where did, do we know where their bearings came from? Their, their correct bearings came from that, 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 that you were asked to fix? Um, I don't know where it came from. I just know, know that when I checked, there were, you know, the stop was going north and not south like they were saying so cool no that's good to that's good to understand um being asked every friday to justify not agreeing with suggested corrections so is this they come back to you every week to say have you made these corrections yeah until i reached a level of rudeness that i felt was a bit too rude but then they stopped <laughs> <laughs> but basically we've not made the corrections because we don't agree with them go away <laughs> I can I can understand that that would be very frustrating to just have to constantly repeat yourself. Like I, I said did, last week, I didn't start with that level. It was like, um, well, we have looked at them, and they, these are the corrections we think needed making. And then next Friday, we get the same question again. <laughs> I, I I can totally empathise with that one. <laughs> um, 
No sensible approach to finding out who was responsible for BODs and directing all information at that person. Local authorities in my area were keeping each other informed. So I'm getting from this that a nice, consistent information flow is really, really important. Yes. And so this leads to a question from us at NAPTAN, because we're having to go through and do a similar thing of getting you all to make changes, getting you all to change your systems, and that as we will build the new system, there will be little things that you have to tweak and change. Are we doing the communication in the right way? Are we, are we giving you the right, are we giving you people to talk to in a way that feels a lot more coherent or feels coherent? In some ways, I think it depends what you're going to do next. Because because you're talking to people who already know about the, the sessions that you're running here, but I only actually found out about these se sessions by accident. Um, and what I found certainly with boards was that I'd get some information, other people would get other information, other people in my team, my mm. the manager of the, presumably it went to the chief engineer and trickled way, its way down to departmental head, who I bumped into at the photocopier one day, who said, what are you, what are you copying? I said, oh, it's to do with boards. Oh, I keep getting emails about that. Well, duh, could you send them to me, please? <laughs> right, so it's 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 coherent information, but to the right people. Yeah. And as what well. do you do now people don't have photocopiers to find things out from? Well, exactly. That's what worries me, isn't it? <laughs> That's a really good point, because we're all in this wonderful world. Um, that everyone was using the same system to manage NAPTAN. Yeah, I, I, I understand that there is, there's 87 or so of you who update NAPTAN and every single one of you is doing it slightly differently. Every single local transport authority, every single one has a slightly different system, a slightly different processes, slightly different ways of doing things. Does that feel like a good assumption to make? Like you, I know, I feel like I, I'm almost going to know you all by name and probably at some point in time, I will get to visit you all and have a cup of tea or coffee in my case, and just go, oh, it's lovely to actually see you and meet you and, and, and understand what you're trying to do in your systems. But I'm getting the sense that this is not a big community, but you're, you're, you're all, we would normally call you edge cases. You all do things slightly differently and what you do in common is actually a really small piece. It's all the differences that we really need to take real note of and start thinking about. Would that, does that feel like the right way of thinking about you? Mark? You can tell me that you're all much more alike than I'm considering. Uh, I, I think it's somewhere in the middle because not everybody uses different software, but um, there's there's at least a dozen bits of different software um, and different ways of thinking about things. And there's also the, those differences between rural and urban or mostly rural and mostly urban and all of those configuration pieces just start to make you all not quite special cases but we want to make sure that you get the best experience possible and the best transition possible if we have to move you from one system to another we take into account all the different changes that you're going to have to make um, that one mapping system was more accurate than the other. So this is again about the Owen open street map versus other maps versus other maps. And we, there's been an assumption made that whatever system they're using is more accurate. 
than whatever other systems are being used. So I can understand why that would be frustrating. Um, assumption, what made us sad? Assumption that the data was wrong and could easily be changed. So there was an assumption made that you would, that your data was always just going to be wrong. Um, I have to say that passenger 4%, I keep on hearing that NAPTAN data is 4% wrong. And yet when I try to dig into that 4%, nobody can tell me exactly what that 4% is and it changes every time. That stat has a longer life than, than anything else around NAPTAN that I've heard. Um, and the other thing that made us sad was the way it was approached and the number of people's backs it got up. I do, I can understand this from all of the other pieces. Is there anything else that we could have approached better or we, if we want you to do something, I would say do something similar. If we need you to make changes to your data or if we need you to think about tweaking your data, um, what's, what are ways that we could do it that would not make you, that would not get your backs up? Is there anything that we can learn from this? For not, for not needing to change 15,000 NAPTAN points in Greater Manchester. <laughs> wow, is that how many you had to change, Mark? Uh, no, I, I just meant if you, we've got a, I'm just sort of a bit, still trying to get my head around that. We've got a NAPTAN schema that sort of lists all the rules that we currently work on and that everyone's already confirming to, and I'm just trying to figure out I'm just sorry, I'm just trying to figure out why there's so much of a need to try and really change something that's already working. I think some of it is around trying to also extend it a little bit because I know that we would like eventually to put accessibility data in. So how do we bring you across so that you can start to put in accessibility data um, in a way that doesn't make life more difficult for you in a way that fits with the software that you're using and things like that. So I don't want to go changing anything to try to please anybody. I, sorry, I'm trying isn't, to sing the Isn't accessibility song data already part of the NAPTAN 2.5 scheme? Yes, but we can't currently ingest that schema. So if we want you to put that information in and we want people to change schemas, that's going to be a big change for some people and a smaller change for others. So we want to sit down with you all and really understand what that change means for all of those different groups. Would be the way that I would approach it. Um, and I'm happy to take feedback on that approach. Right. Oh, die. It's just a slightly sideways thing. A, a useful, potentially useful thing would be to ask people why they, which messages and why they ignore the, not ignore, suppress the uh, errors on ITO currently. Mm. Oh, yes. That's a really, really good way of thinking about it. And in fact, I'm probably going to come and have a chat with you about that, which oh, leads right. me on to the very last one in the last minute, um, which is action points for Jay and Adrian. And one of them will be talk to Die about suppression. To Die W about uh, Eto world suppressed uh, warnings. Because I really want to understand, because I've seen it and I was looking through just taking random stops around and looking at the number of times a warning would pop up and then it would be suppressed and it'd be suppressed like four or five times. And then it looks like the rule changes slightly and a slightly different wording of the warning pops up and that gets suppressed over and over. And it's trying to understand why and this led me to looking at the business rules and really understanding why what are the best business rules, but it's also understanding why business rules are throwing false positives and creating havoc for people. Uh, Mark. Uh, yeah, a lot of, 
a lot of some warning suppressions I've done, it'll be um, well going on the bearings is for like turning circles when there's not really a turning circle on the map and it's being on a straight line. When I, mean, I don't really want it pointing down the straight line because it's going to be a turning circle for going back on the other way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lot of the other warnings are saying um, because the locality names in the stop name, even though there's part of the schema that does say uh, it's advised against, but not really against it. If something actually is called something, so like we'll have Wigan bus station, we will call it Wigan bus station as an app point. We will just call it bus station because mm -hmm. a lot of journey planners don't put the locality in the uh, common name. Um, so it is, a lot of the suppressions we do uh, is just either qu queries on grey areas in the schema, which we will just say no, and it is right. Or them, or like some of them other warnings that came back from yourselves in the spreadsheets about road names and stuff like that. Uh, and we're just saying no, no, the road name is right. It's whatever mapping software you're using. That's generally how that's generally our suppressions, which happen to be quite a few. Yeah, I I know I know this one which I'm going to mention, which Jared will probably laugh at because it's one that I recall. It's Tottenham Court Road. Great Russell Street, which flags warnings because it's constantly using the word road, street, and all of that. And it's literally one of the bus stops that I've used, which is why I knew it. And it's Tottenham Court Road area, Great Russell Street, because that's where that bus stop is. And I've seen that suppressed over and over and over. And it constantly seems to bring up warnings about the fact that there's road and street standing next to each other. So it, I think that's a really interesting area to kind of understand what's a decent rule. Um, Tricia and then okay. Mark. Um, I was just going to say the same as Mark really. A lot of it is um, suppressions to do with the locality name and the common name, the bearings. Um, without going back into my data, I, I can't remember all of them that I've suppressed, but you know, there, there's various ones that I actively always suppress. Yeah, and I don't want to create something that gives you a whole pile of posit false positives that, that you've got to go and suppress because that's extra work for you yeah. for no win. School bus and parks are a big one for me, actually, because obviously they're, park. yeah, school bus parks. So where you've, where you've got um, a local bus that goes into a school, um, obviously they have no roads. So you just kind of call them bus park in the road name and things. So I don't know if anybody else creates stops in schools. Um, that don't yeah. have roads but I also get I get errors to say it's um the wrong bearing I get errors to say it should be on this road when it's not so you end up suppressing quite a lot of things for one nap time stop you've created in a school right that that must be really really frustrating um I, I have I have found in the nap, uh, in the ITO warnings I want to suppress it it doesn't flag up again unless anything of that nap time point changes by yourself by ourselves. So once you suppress it, it stays suppressed until you change the point and then it loses its its suppression and you have to go back and resuppress it. Yeah. So like, yeah, we can suppress it and then if we move a coordinate or rename it or something, I think because something's changed, it then does another validate and check on it and then we'll highlight any of them. Val uh, you'll think, think maybe you have gone in to validate it or whatever or change anything so we'll just run the whole validation again yeah um i mean well like i said you know once once we make a stop we don't it's not very often the uh, need to go back changing mm. yeah although yeah renaming stops happens and that um is there any any so I'm going to go talk to Di, Mark, Tyre, and Trisha. Is there anyone else who would just love a one-to-one? -one? Just love to kind of get me in and talk and talk me through what 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 you're doing for half an hour, forty-five minutes, and tell me your big your biggest pain points. You're more than welcome to it. So thank you everyone again for your time. I think that's the end of the meeting. We've gone about six minutes over. Um, so sorry about that, but I really, really appreciate your time and your feedback on this. I really appreciate the effort that you're putting in to letters and to communicate with us. And I and I really 
appreciate your trust that we're going to do something constructive with all of this and not just talk it, not just talk with you and do nothing. So thank you. Thank you all again.